Hello, everyone. Welcome for cut. Welcome and thank you for coming today. Uh, today's speaker is military historian Michael Johnson, who is going to be uh, giving us background on the Canadian <clears throat> peacekeeping forces, which were founded in the 1950s by then Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson. And it's quite an interesting one. So, Michael. Oh, well, thank you, Susan. Um, Basically, uh, peacekeeping has existed as long as the United Nations in the wake of World War II, uh, especially in the Middle East, there were problems and in India and Pakistan. These are things that are still ongoing today. However, um, Canada created a new kind of peacekeeping in 1956 uh, in the wake of the Suez crisis. So I'm going to give you a little presentation which documents uh, the history of Canadian peacekeeping and um, tells you a little bit about where we were and where we have been and unfortunately where we are today. This is the history of Canada's involvement in peacekeeping. And you can see here this the iconic blue helmet. Most people don't know that uh, this is not really it didn't come from the United Nations. The, uh, when they put together the United Nations Emergency Force in uh, Egypt and Pal Pal between Egypt and Israel, they suddenly realized that they didn't have any distinctive uniform and no way to tell who was a peacekeeper. And here it was, our, our friends, the Americans stepped in and said, well, we have got a warehouse full of old helmet liners from the Second World War. What if you guys painted them blue? And that's what they did. And ever since it's become the icon of UN peacekeepers. Now, prior to 1956, there are three main UN uh, missions. Palestine, there was uh, a supervision team put in to just, you know, observe the uh, peace, keep, peace between the uh, Israel and the Arab nations, and that lasted. It's still in existence. At the same time, you know, India and Pakistan in the wake of you know, independence had their, their war over Kashmir. And again, there are still peacekeeping observers on that as well. And the first uh, person on that mission was a Canadian. He was the chief military observer, Harry Engel. And on his way to take his post, he was killed when his plane crashed. He became the first Canadian to be killed in the line of duty in peacekeeping. Now, we don't talk about Korea as a peacekeeping mission, but after the Korean War, while they after the ceasefire was signed, there were uh, still forces in Korea and uh, they were, after 1953, when the truce was signed, they basically were classed as peacekeepers and they are entitled to the peacekeeping medal that was issued a few years ago. The real change comes in 1956. The Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, decided he was going to nationalize the Suez Canal because he had a number of things, projects like the Aswan Dam that he wanted, and he wasn't getting monetary uh, support from the Western nations. So we figured if, if we own the Suez Canal rather than the British and French company, then we can charge tolls and that money will finance our projects. So the British reacted to that along with the French by sending in uh, their armed forces attacking and basically they recaptured the Suez Canal. But under pressure from the United States and the United Nations, they were forced to withdraw. The problem is, how do you withdraw in a situation which is basically a, a war zone? And this is where Lester V. Pearson, who was then the external affairs minister, decided, what if we send in lightly armed forces in combat unit size 
and ask them basically to keep the two sides separate, monitor things, and you know they've got some ways of defending themselves and taking care of it. So he put together a force and you know, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Denmark, Finland, India, Indonesia, Norway, Sweden, and Yugoslavia all joined that. And they uh, monitored the ceasefire until 1967 when Abdel Nasser decided to tell them to get out. And of course, if those of us who are old enough remember, the results were catastrophic for Egypt because that was the second Anglo-Israeli war. And basically, you know, Egypt lost the whole of the West Bank and a few other things. Now, the longest running uh, peacekeeping mission that Canada has ever been on was in Cyprus. It ran from 1964 to you know, keeping the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots separate. And uh, about 25,000 Canadian Forces members took part on that. Some of them have been there three or four times. Later on, the, uh, when the Soviet Union broke down uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, the various nationalities that made up Yugoslavia decided, most of them decided they wanted to become independent. So it turned into a basically a battle for turf between the Serbs, the Croats, and the Muslims. And this was a case where basically, although the idea is that peacekeepers are just there to keep the peace, the Canadians found out that to keep the peace, you occasionally had to fight back. And in the Medak pocket in 1993, Canadians were sent in to try to stop ethnic cleansing by one side. And the Croatian forces decided they were going to move them out of the way by intimidation. So they opened fire on the Canadians, thinking that they would just move out of the way and get out of the way to avoid casualties. However, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry were made of rather sterner stuff. They held their ground and fired back. And basically, they were unable to stop the ethnic cleansing, but they basically inflicted more casualties on the Croatians than they suffered themselves, and basically showed uh, everyone that the Canadians were not going to back down or be intimidated. Now, not all peacekeeping is done under the United Nations. You know, in the wake of the Vietnam War, starting in 1954, when the French had to leave all the way up through the American time, uh, there were, were peacekeeping bodies, uh, the International Commission for Security and Control and you know, the successor who went in to try to monitor things. Eventually, of course, uh, the Canadians left in 1975 because they realized there wasn't any peace to keep. You know, the two sides were intent on fighting the whole war out and they just made the Canadians pulled out. The United Nations got tired of being in the Middle East so after the 1973 war, they didn't renew the peacekeeping. It was taken over by a multinational force and observers. And Canada still has 55 members serving in the Middle East and the Sinai. And of course, in former Yugoslavia, NATO stepped in and sent in forces, you know, an implementation force, a security force, and a force in Kosovo. So none of those were United Nations missions. Now, Canada, we're peaceful people, yeah, but we've, when we have to fight, we have a very good track record. So we've shown the same amount of courage in peacekeeping operations, but unfortunately, we don't, the peacekeepers just do not get the kind of recognition that they, you know, the wartime people get. One example of this is that Canada has created its highest award, the Victoria Cross, we have never awarded it to anyone, despite being in Afghanistan, despite being in peacekeeping. You know, Australia and New Zealand have both awarded it several times. We make do with much lesser awards. So the Victoria Cross is the highest award. It has never been awarded. The Star of Courage 
is awarded very rarely. The Meritorious Service Cross is given out. It's not strictly a courage award. It can also be for good service. The Medal of Bravery is the most common probably of, to be awarded. And there's also the Meritorious Service Medal. In the later slide, I will talk about what one person did to receive the Meritorious Service Medal. Now, the Congo in the 1960s, the Belgians were pulling out, they were leaving their former colony, and basically a civil war broke out. Uh, the Katanga province tried to separate, and a peacekeeping sent, force was sent in there. Now, one of the problems was the rebels, you know, in you know, the Katanga province that were targeting anyone who was Belgian. That included a large number of missionaries, priests, and nuns. So the Canadians were tasked with evacuating these people. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Mayer, who was on the left of the photograph there, went in to you know, retrieve some of these religious from the uh, rebel hands. He was knocked out, and his pistol was pulled, and one young man tried to shoot him. Fortunately, there was no round. He was able to wake up, negotiate, get some of them aboard the helicopter, and made arrangements to free the remaining hostages. His sergeant, Sergeant Lassard on the left, you know, saved two nuns. Basically, one of them was on a stretcher. He got the stretcher on board. There was a group of four of these rebels who were trying to pull him down. He was kicking them off as he was loading the nuns onto the helicopter. You know, and he finally got the last one kicked away. He hopped on board the elevator, the helicopter, which was already in the air at this point. Now, the problem was the government didn't know what in the world, in the way of a medal, do we award him? Because we're not in a war, and most of our medals are meant for wartime. So they were given the George Medal. And the George Medal is specifically for gallantry, not for In 1974, there was a coup in Cyprus, and the Greek Cypriots were trying to basically turn Cyprus into a Greek province and hand the whole of the province, the whole of the island over to uh, Greece. Tur Turkey would not settle for that. They basically sent in their army and air force, and there was an open war going on between the Greek. Cypriots and the Turkish forces. Meanwhile, our peacekeepers were caught in the middle and they are trying basically to keep the peace in between whether it, there was no peace. So these are a couple of awards, several awards that were given in Cyprus in 1974. And basically these people were under machine gun fire, cannon fire, and they were taking casualties and they, tried, they were basically saving each other and trying to save the lives of the people. Now, I don't know any of you have read a book called The Cellist of Sarajevo. It's an excellent book. If you want some real uh, background as to what was going on in Sarajevo in Bosnia in 1992, that's the book to read. It's, a, it's fiction, but it's based on human events that went on. So part of the problem was Sarajevo was under siege by Serbian forces. There were snipers firing into the, uh, into the streets. And two Canadians basically went in to rescue two women who had been wounded by sniper fire. And you know, they managed to evacuate both of them. They were awarded the Medal of Bravery, which is basically the third class of gallantry medal available. Now, Philip Bad and I was one of those people who talked, you know, at my exhibition at the Oakville Museum. He was returning from a mission in Croatia with a, one other soldier in a jeep. And they, as they rounded a corner in a village, they were opened fire on by 20 armed Serbs. They shot out the tires. They shot up the jeep. Both Phil and his uh, friend were wounded badly. So Phil basically, hit the gas, turned off his lights, 
and drove 13 kilometers back to base to try to get medical aid. He was driving with one hand with tires out on both sides on two of, two of the wheels. He had his hand up, holding on to his friend's ear to try to keep the blood from flowing. His driving was so erratic, they sent military police out to arrest him as a drunk driver. Then they realized what had happened. Uh, he suffered from PTSD as a result of this and was medically released from the forces. Now, he trained for the 2017 Invictus Games for Disabled Veterans, and he was chosen as flag bearer for the Canadian participants. What he did not mention is the fact that he was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal for what for his actions that day. He also did not mention the fact that he'd had a heart attack while training, but kept on going. That's why his fellow uh, veterans made him the flag bearer for the games. So these are some of the medals that are awarded for peacekeeping. The United Nations medals tend to be the same medal, as you can see with the, uh, the, the Cyprus medal here, and the one for the Gola Heights. They just change the ribbon. If you do more than one tour, you get to put another number up to show how many times you were there. This is from the original 1956 mention mission in the Middle East. And then, of course, NATO strikes its own medals with its own ribbons for it. Now, in 1988, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to peacekeepers in you know, recognition of all the work they had done. So Canada decided to create a special medal for its peacekeepers. And it wasn't until 1997 that they actually came into being. And the first awards weren't until 2000. Now, there are literally thousands of veterans of peacekeeping who never received this medal. You had to apply for it yourself. It wasn't automatic. And there are people in the Canadian Legion who basically spend their time meeting with veterans and applying for their medals that they don't have or have lost. Now, one thing about, if you think back to the 1940s and 1950s, the average Canadian, unless they were serving in World War, had never gone overseas. They probably spoke either just English or just French. So they came into contact with people of other countries, other cultures and other countries, other religions. And the, uh, it's very interesting the effect that this had on these Canadians. So for example, Al Ditter, who was in Cyprus in 1965 to 66, you know, says that basically they love to eat the street food there, which would be ground up goat meat uh, with pitas. And uh, when they got back, of course, they developed a taste for this. So you can imagine walking into an IGA or a Sobeys or something like that if they're having in the 1950s, 1950s, 1960s, small town and saying, um, have you got any kebab skewers? Um, or going to the LCBO and say, uh, do, you, do you stock any ouzo? You know, these things. In those days, grocery stores in Canada didn't know where to put rice because they thought, oh, you make rice pudding with it. So it was a bit of a change for these people. People also, um, you had to work in a number of different languages. So uh, Staff Sergeant Patterson was in Egypt in 1958, and he was a storesman. And you know, to deal with all these contingents, he had to be able to speak Hindi, Arabic, Greek, Danish, Norwegian, German, French, and Spanish. You know, and these were the days when having French in your school was something fairly new. One of the people who was with me at the museum was Greg Munns. He was in Cyprus in the 1960s. And it, they attached him to the Finnish contingent. And uh, he made a lot of friends there. And as you can see, they gave him one of their, uh, their jackets. They gave him a, a doll in a, a Lapland uh, costume, uh, a knife, a commemorative knife. And he has the photographs. And there's a Finnish English dictionary that he used when he was there. He was still, he wonders now, whether he can ever find some of these people and get in touch with them again after all these years. Now, besides medals, you know, all soldiers like to have souvenirs. So 
one thing you do is you buy the local crafts. And you, these ones are a couple of wallets. So Michael. Hi, Susan. Oh. Did he just log off? He may have been kicked out. Um, uh, okay. I think, yeah, it's okay. I'll just stop recording. Wait. There you go. Thank you. All right. So I'm not quite sure where you left off. Um, it was. Uh, I'll back, I can back up a couple of slides. Okay. Okay, okay, that was the last one. That was the last one you saw? Yeah. Okay, so I'll take it from there. Okay, so um, this was Greg Muntz. He was in Cyprus and basically um, he worked with the Finnish contingent because he was an English speaker and they most of them did not have English. Uh, they gave him a lot of souvenirs of uh, the knife, the doll. There's actually a large uh, lap uh, horn, which is a large, a little large put in the display and photographs. He often wonders basically whether, you know, his friends are still alive and whether uh, they he never get in touch with them again. Uh, soldiers love souvenirs. Uh, these are some of the things that were brought back. Uh, from Cyprus, there's a leather wallet with a map of Cyprus, you know, embossed on it, and a little metal uh, cigarette case with built-in lighter for the map of Cyprus again, I was brought back from uh, in the 1960s. In Egypt, they do a marvelous work with uh, engraving these uh, beer mugs. Of course, soldier beer. Uh, you have maps of England, of Egypt with the um, ancient Egypt symbols on it. And then UNEF for the, uh, the mission, the man's name, Colonel, uh, Captain Hawking, who was with the signals, later became a high school teacher in Burlington. And he was there in 1962 to 63. Um, often there would be tour plaques given out to the soldiers. This one was for uh, the Middle East in the 1970s. He did two tours. Uh, the Golden Heights. Uh, he was also in Cyprus, uh, Warrant Officer Moran. And then in Cyprus, uh, Moran also received a plaque very similar to this for his service in Cyprus. This is one to the Canadian uh, Princess Patricia's Light Infantry. Now, the old idea of military observers has continued on. So, uh, one very interesting mission was Guatemala in 1997. And this is a photograph of two of the military observers. To the left, Eva Martinez, who was with the RCAF, and Major Walter Watkins with the Van Dues. Now, Eva was the first female Canadian military observer. Now, right now, there's a requirement that any mission uh, under the UN auspices has to be 15% women. But Eva was the first Canadian military observer. And as you can see from the spread here, these are the pastiche of uh, Guatemalan newspaper articles. They had never seen a female military peacekeeper before. So obviously the press went wild and they gave her all kinds of coverage. And because she's the only one they've ever seen, 
her nickname was La Unica, the only one. Uh, very strong-minded woman. I met her two years ago. Everyone on the mission had to be a Spanish speaker. And there were only 25 Spanish speakers in the Canadian Armed Forces at that time. So even though she was not a, a soldier, she was in the Air Force, she became part of the mission. Now, when she got to Guatemala, she found out that the officer in command overall was a Spanish general, and Eva was Spanish. Now, the general had other ideas, you know, said, Eva, I want you to stay here at base with me and be my aide. Now, normally, it's not a good idea to say no to a general, especially your commanding officer. Eva said, no, I'm going up country with the rest of the men. And she got away with it. However, when she got up country, she found out that men she was working at didn't know quite what to make of her. So she said, well, look, we'll take one corner of the, uh, the hut that's our, our barracks, and I'll just curtain it off with some blankets, and that's where I'll live. And I said, you can't do that. No, there's a tent out there. You go live there. Well, the tent was leaky and falling apart and not really fit for living in. So she said, wait a minute, there's another tent over there, a really good one. So, oh, no, no, that, that's for visiting uh, officers. And she said, great. Until one comes along, I'll sleep there. And she did. Then they thought, are you going to cook for us? She said, no, I'm not cooking for you. I'll help you arrange for some, for some of the local people to come in and cook for you. And I'm not doing your laundry either. And if you look down here in the bottom picture, uh, the man there that you know, was talking to the, the press is Alex Fiegler. I knew him at university. He was the commanding officer for the Canadians. And he told me that Eva basically outmarched and outthought everyone else on the mission. Even though it's a Spanish speaking country, she realized most of the people they were dealing with, their first language was the local Indian dialect. So she went and she met with the women and she learned how to speak the local language. And of course, these women who would never would have talked to the male soldiers and told them anything, would tell her everything. So she had better intelligence than the rest of the mission did. Unfortunately, peacekeeping is not peaceful. And over 170 Canadians have died in the course of Canadian peacekeeping operations. Most of them were in Korea during the ceasefire, but you can see that they've all been, you know, taking their casualties in one form or another. And the, the casualties of all kinds, there are road accidents, there have been suicides, there have been friendly fire incidents, there have been plane crashes, there have been planes that have been shot down by other forces. And the greatest of those was on August the 9th, 1974, when a Canadian forces Buffalo from 116 ATU was shot down by three Syrian anti-aircraft missiles, missiles. Nine Canadians were on board and lost their lives. So the day that they were killed has now been designated National Peacekeepers Day. Even those who were not wounded have paid a mental price for it too. So post-traumatic stress disorder affects peacekeepers just as much as it does wartime soldiers. And those are people that we know committed suicide while on a mission. And we don't know how many people, you know, committed suicide afterwards as a result of the effects of PTSD. This is one example. So Robert Joliat, he came from a distinctive fam distinguished family. His grandfather was the first Francophone chief of police. His uncle, Aurel Joliat, was a Canadian superstar. He did a Hockey Hall of Famer. He joined the armed forces and did two peacekeeping tours, one in Cyprus in 1974, and one in the Middle East with the signals in uh, 1977. In 1980, after he came back to Canada, he shot himself. 
And at the inquiry, his fiance said he found his tours difficult. And in Egypt, his roommates reported that they were worried about him because he'd sit in the room just staring. They got him to see a doctor, but he apparently removed the doctor's report from his personnel file. And unfortunately, a lot of soldiers avoid seeking medical help because too often the armed forces simply says, you're medically unfit, you can't do your job, and we'll discharge you. There is also the isolation. In the early days, of course, everything was by mail. So little you know, blue aerograms that you would send back to the family, you know, saying what you were doing and hoping that they were well. If you were lucky, you had a radio operator in the signal squadron who would call up a Canadian ham operator who would then dial the telephone number for the person's you know, home and they would patch the call, call through and you'd be able to talk to your, your family directly. But you had to keep on reminding to say over when you were finished talking so the other person could then respond. Later on, some missions had internet access and cell phone access, depending on the availability in the country. So this is an example of a QSL card with the hammer operators you would send out. And Frank Richards here basically is patching in a phone call for one of his fellow soldiers. Now, at the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, the government was looking for a peace dividend. Now we can cut defense spending. Well, it was cut so much that in 1993, when the second PPCLI were in the medic pocket, 85% of the battalion were reservists, as there weren't enough regular army soldiers available. The end of the Cold War saw the breakup of Yugoslavia and between UNPROFOR, the UN mission, and the NATO missions, Canada contributed as many as 1,200 troops between 1992 and 2010. And of course, from 2001 on, Canada was engaged in Afghanistan with 1,200 troops committed there. The mission to Rwanda under General Romeo Dallaire was marked by the UN's failure to authorize sufficient forces to stop the genocide. And Romeo Dallaire suffered an incredible breakdown from PTSD and uh, was a good thing for soldiers in general, because if a general has PTSD, it's okay. And maybe there is something to this idea about PST, PTSD, and maybe soldiers just don't have to suck it up and get on with things. And then in Somalia, which we remember for the death of a Somali teenager, was an embarrassment for the Canadian government and it further tarnished the armed forces and peacekeeping in the public mind. Now, one of the veterans who talked at my program, Mike O'Brien, who was at the Benedict Pocket, as well as Cyprus, Bosnia, and Afghanistan, said, I've never called myself a peacekeeper. We were soldiers on peacekeeping missions. And one reason we've been successful is because we have a well-trained, highly professional armed forces. And in the old days, we were actually very well equipped because we were stocked up to Cold War uh, levels. So when we went to former Yugoslavia, we actually brought more equipment than the UN had authorized. So we were able to protect ourselves and you know, establish a presence. Soldiers accept the job entails risks. But when governments mindful of costs and fearful of public reaction to casualties do not contribute to peacekeeping or narrow their contribution to just the less, less risky missions, then peacekeeping suffers. In 2017, our prime minister promised a new commitment to peacekeeping. It hasn't materialized. We currently are 70th out of 122 nations contributing to UN peacekeeping operations. In 1993, almost 30 years ago, we had over 3,000 peacekeepers in the field. This year, we had 60 military and police deployed on UN missions. 32 were police, 22 staff officers, six experts on mission, and none of them are listed as troops. Another 55 Canadians serve in the Sinai with the multinational force and observers. 
we're leaving the job up to third world countries. And you look at the top peacekeepers, Bangladesh, Nepal, India, Rwanda, and Pakistan are the top five contributors, all of whom have more forces in the field than we'd had 30 years ago. But why should we contribute to peacekeeping? Canada applied for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. We failed to get it. Why? Well, one contributing factor is other nations may have felt that our contributions to world security just didn't live up to what was promised. If we want to be a world leader, we have to take steps to take our place and you know, make the commitment. So thank you very much. That's my presentation. And um, you know, if anyone has any, any questions, I would help be quite happy to take them. Well, of course, the question is um, to keep in touch with the Oakville Museum to see when this might be coming back. Um, that's that's uh, really fast. I mean, like I can remember uh, the 90s and, and all of that happening, but it says a lot that we really don't know about our, our military. No, they don't tend to advertise what they do. Uh, you know, the press is only interested in what goes wrong, or when we take heavy casualties. Um, the Oakville Museum is said basically, we did shoot a video, we were hoping to use it last November, uh, it wasn't ready in time. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully that will be edited and up as well for people who can't make it into Oakville, be a, a tour of the exhibition, which mm -hmm. I gave. Uh, and hopefully that'll be up on their website on Facebook, or on the, you know, and uh, be available for people who uh, would like to see the exhibition, but can't make it in. That's excellent, but it would be good to see the the actual exhibit, and hopefully, if you could get some more of the speakers back. Well, I've, that is in the works. Um, Eva Martinez actually says I'm going to be going to London, Ontario, on business in November, and I can tack a few days on, so she's available. Excellent. Her commanding officer, my friend Alex Fiegler, who last when I last saw him was living in Italy with his wife, who was a Canadian ambassador has now moved to Oakville. <laughs> and hopefully he'll be available. That would be Plus, amazing. You know, uh, the two uh, people who combined with me on this exhibition are still available. You know, and maybe we can get uh, Mike Badney, sorry, Mike O'Brien and Phil Badney back on as well. Okay, well, look forward to that then. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we're not totally sure who is speaking next week, but week after will be Julia Rady Shaw about architecture and heritage in Toronto, such as we bought left. Uh, and then on June 24th, William King, don't be a drag queen in, in honor of Pride Month. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Michael. All right. Well, thank you very much for hosting this. Thank you, Michael. Nice well, meeting you. you. All right. Have a good weekend. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.